good evening, everybody. How y'all doing? It's good to see all of you tonight. Hey, John. Hi, everyone. I'm going to be admitting people from the waiting room uh, for a while, but we'll we'll go give it a few minutes and we'll get going. It's good to see everybody. Good to be with you. So what we'll do is we'll hang out at 6.59. We'll hang out for about four minutes or five, and then uh, we'll give, give a little bit of a buffer in there, and then we'll, we'll begin. I hope everybody's doing okay. Now, I don't know anybody. Let me look around. Nope, I don't know anyone. I know Jenny. Hello. That Hello. might be it. Hey, I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. And I'm fairly new. I've been uh, part of the, I think it's called Exploration Sunday School class for about two months. Um, so I haven't been inside the church building yet, but I participated in a couple of things. So, hello. Lovely. Welcome. I'm glad, I'm glad you're with us. And, and a hello to uh, Jerry am I, Bushel. Am I saying your name right or wrong? If I'm wrong, I apologize. Bushel. Bushel. W welcome. Thank you. Glad you're with us here. All right. Okay, what's going on? Yeah. All right. A few more hopping on. We'll we'll keep sitting tight until it's time to time to go live. All right, John. Hello. Good to see. You. Good to glad you're with us. <laughs> it's good to be with. You. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You all are doing well. We are. How, how are you and Jamie? We we we're, we're trying. We're we're wearing our mask and all of that stuff, but this stuff is getting worse. Uh, yeah, I hear you. It's um, it's definitely a season where. You know, it's like we're at an odd combination of being fatigued and ready for this to change, while at the mm -hmm. same time it becomes more acute, and uh, that's definitely brings um, nuanced and and not so nuanced layers of stress to life. Yes, it does. How you doing, John? Jamie, I'm good. I, I hope you're doing well too. It's good to yeah, hear your voice, both of y'all. Yeah, yes, we've been, we've been doing fine. Good. Now I got this bar on the side. How's the wife doing? She's doing all right. She's uh, wow. with a friend of hers in Mississippi. Wow. Yeah, Great. she she drove. She didn't fly. So I, uh, I'm i just, I'm bachelor in it tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <Yeah>. Hi. <laughs> wow. Well, you get both worlds, with and without her. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we'll hang out for another two minutes or so, friends, and then, then we'll get going. Right. So what you been doing, walking the dog? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, while she's not here, I've been <laughs> doing walking the dog, been playing, uh, playing a lot of records obnoxiously loud, you know, because I can. <laughs> uh, so, you know, things like that. <laughs> Did the dog go to Mississippi? No, she's with me. So it, it's good. You know, I got I got a companion. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. Well, uh, so friends, why don't we go ahead and begin? So I, I say at the top of things here, a word of welcome to everybody who's with us tonight. I'm very glad that you've joined. This is gonna be a really fascinating study and I've been looking forward to this for a while. I have an opening prayer that I'd like to use and it comes from a man whose prayers I've used a lot named Ted Loader, Gorillas of Grace. He has prayers in here that are thematically tied to a lot of things. This is one that's tied to winter and when I read it I thought this would be a nice one for us to open with. So friends why don't we why don't we go to God together in prayer. Let us pray. O God of all seasons and senses, grant me your sense of timing to submit gracefully and rejoice quietly in the turn of the seasons. In this season of short days and long nights, of gray and white and cold, 
teach me the lessons of waiting, of the snow joining the mystery, of the hunkered down seeds growing in their sleep, watched over by gnarled limbed grandparent trees, resting from autumn's staggering energy of the silent whirling earth, circling to race back home to the sun. Oh God, grant me your sense of timing in this season of short days and long nights. Teach me the lessons of endings, children growing, friends leaving, jobs concluding, stages finishing, grieving over, grudges over, blaming over, excuses over. Oh God, grant me your sense of timing in this season of short days and long nights. Teach me the lessons of beginnings, that such waitings and endings may be a starting place, a planting of seeds, which bring to birth what is ready to be born, something right and just and different, a new song, a deeper relationship, a fuller love in the fullness of your time. Oh God, grant me your sense of timing. Amen. So friends, I'm uh, going to do a couple of housekeeping things here at the top of the hour. This is the same link that you can use for the next uh, couple of weeks in a row. The link will be the same for these Zoom gatherings. These are recorded so that others who can't join in the evenings can still participate. They're going to be put on the church's uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so during the interactive portions of our Zoom hour tonight, what I have found that works the best is when it's time for group discussion, if you physically raise your hand in the air, or if you want to use the raise the hand function in Zoom, I can call on you. Um, that tends to work the best rather than free form. And uh, if, if you happen to be in a scenario where you are joining in a way where uh, you can't use uh, the microphone, if you don't have a microphone, if you type in what you want to say in the chat, I'll read it on your behalf as well. So that way your voice can be heard. A couple of uh, items about terminology. So I'm going to be interchangeably using black and African American to describe those specific persons of color. And it's going to be heard in the plural as well, blacks, African Americans. You're also going to be hearing the term persons of color, which, uh, and also black indigenous persons of color, sometimes abbreviated BIPOC. That word, some of y'all might be aware of, this might be the first time you've heard that phrase, that terminology, but it stands for, like I said a moment ago, black indigenous persons of color. And it is a term to name and describe that there are a wide tapestry of races. And it is, a, it is a catchphrase for that tapestry. So I want to talk for a moment about the authors. So the, the two authors who wrote the, the book that I'm using, the first one is Cheryl Kirk Dugan. She's a professor of theology and women's studies and the director of women's studies at Shaw University, just right down the road in Raleigh. And Marilyn Thornton, she is the lead editor for Abington Press's Bible study series based on spirituals. She's taught at Howard, Tennessee State Universities and is the campus minister at the Wesley Foundation in Nashville, Tennessee. So they are the authors, the co-authors of Mary Had a Baby. The next thing I want to say before we, we get going, we all bring a lens to everything that we study and we learn about. I will speak for myself. What's my lens that I bring? Male, white, able-bodied, this is something I bring to the study even as I teach it, which is why I chose the anchor resource that carries the voices of two African-American professors because of that very fact. The lenses we bring, they're not anything to be ashamed of. They're not anything that is wrong, but it is something to be named and realized and understood about oneself. We all are very unique individually and thinking about the lenses we bring, especially when we're doing a study about race is very important. So I want to name that at the top of things here too. The, the realization that yes, I am a white male, but the anchor resource I am channeling is from two African American female professors very deliberately. All right, so the housekeeping stuff complete, we can turn to our study. And to get us acclimated, we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about Advent. Advent doesn't begin for two more Sundays but it comes at the fifth Sunday of November, the last Sunday of November, which makes it enter the calendar year in an interesting time. And so that's why I'm starting this study now. I'm front-loading it before Thanksgiving. So what does Advent mean as a season? 
it is a time of preparation. It is a time of simultaneously looking inward and looking outward. Kirk Dugan, one of the authors, she, she names it as a season of declaring that even though we did not know who Jesus was when God came wrapped in flesh for the first time, we are cultivating a value system that embraces the hope, joy, and transformation as communal healing that's reborn daily and fulfilled daily now that Emmanuel, God with us, has been here and has left instructions on how to live and how to be people of faith. It's also a time to think about the second coming. We don't do this a lot in the Presbyterian Church, but it's very crucial for our context for the study of African-American spirituals and the legacy of slavery, of colonial and pre-colonial times, all the way down to modern history and the oppression that continues, this concept that one day there will be respite from the injustices suffered on earth. That is replete in lyrics and motifs that musically take shape. There is a, a special connection too in, in the concept of looking at African-American spirituals that are Christmas-based or Advent-based. It's a theology that speaks not only of God who is in heaven above, but also one who is profoundly and unequivocally identifying with those in the world who experience cruelty, injustice, poverty, racism, and oppression. So our focus scripture tonight is going to come from Luke and Matthew, and I'm going to do a share screen. So here is what we are looking at tonight. The first one comes from Luke 1, verses 30 to 31. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. Matthew's Gospel, first chapter, verses 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had borne a son, and he named him Jesus. So to, to get our, our wheels turning, one of the things that I love doing when doing Bible studies, especially ones that, that, are, you, that use characters from Scripture, is to get us thinking about our own context and our own lives. And by that I mean this. It's a, it's a question I want to ask you. So for those of you who are, who are parents, or, or if you're not parents, those of you who have had friends, close friends who have become parents, what do you remember about your first child? Give some context to that. When you say, what do you remember? Do you mean so, about them being born? Yeah, so, sorry, I'll zoom in a little better. What, what, what do you remember about them being born and how you felt those, you know, that first, first couple of minutes, first hour, first couple of days? Yeah, Millie, go ahead, and then Chris. Um, our first baby was born in 66, and th the nurse brought her to me and she was all wrapped up and I started to unwrap her and I was scolded for doing that. I wasn't allowed, I wasn't allowed to unwrap her. <laughs> Chris, what about you? I remember it, it was funny. I just, it was funny. It was amazing. It was like, what? This, this came out of me, what? You know, I did this, we did this, what? So it was just funny, first child. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. Indeed. Sarah, I saw, yeah, I see you. 
So um, my first experience was that's the ugliest baby I've ever seen. <laughs> but, but nobody told me that's the way babies were born. I mean, she grew to be beautiful, but they're kind of icky coming out. But I do remember for me more than anything, it was my, my mother was with us while she was born and her reaction, because she had never seen her children being born, was that it was a miracle. It was miraculous. Yes. It was, you know, whereas I was just sort of like, she's slimy. So, you know, <laughs> my, uh, my, my youngest brother, he and his wife a few months back had their, their, their first baby. It's the first niece, first grandchild in the family. And it was, you know, it was COVID. So none of us could go to the hospital for what you would normally be a family rhythm, a, a family uh, experience. But I remember they sent pictures, of course, and there was one of him holding her and he, uh, the amount of pride that he had on his face uh is something that I, I think you can you only get as a as a parent for your child there's there are no shortcuts to that feeling there's no substitute for it so i remember i remember seeing that in the photograph that's one thing not being a parent myself that's one thing i could tell when i looked at it so oh yeah kim i see you go ahead yeah um i'll just share that um, our son was born at 11 p.m. at night and uh, in December and um, after it was all over I, I was just so exhausted and excited and they had taken him away to run the APGAR tests and, and you know make sure everything was okay and I was just hanging out in the hospital room you know resting and, and I remember a nurse came in at 2 a.m. and she was holding him and she said he's hungry <laughs> and I just remember going oh my god you know here we go you know um, I'm responsible for keeping him alive you know um, it was really uh, overwhelming you know yeah I, I think that's when I realized, you know, the responsibility. The, the that, weight of it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. So, you know, having, having jump-started our engines a little bit with that question, what do y'all think Mary wondered about when she, um, so not, you know, because our, our scripture tonight is uh, her being pregnant. So not, not after Jesus was born, when she found out, what are, what are the kind of things y'all think she may have wondered about <laughs> or thought about? I, I, I have a few, I think. I think she was probably scared. <laughs> and uh, later on in the lesson, I'm going to explain the, at the time in the first century, the social stigma that came with being pregnant and engaged, but not formally married. And there, there's a lot of weight behind what that meant at the time. And I'll get into that in a few minutes. But I uh, was curious, what, what do y'all think she would have been thinking about? Yeah, Chris. Well, I'm guessing, well, okay. Unless she was really confident that God had her back. I mean, well, she might've been, and then she, there were no worries whatsoever. But on the other hand, she could have been thinking, "My, I'm gonna get stoned. They're gonna throw rocks at me till I die. Or my mom's dad, they're not gonna believe me. Mm -hmm. um joseph's not going to believe me so it could have gone either way mm -hmm. a lot of unknowns I, I bet she i bet there were a lot of unanswered questions mm -hmm. so drilling into the context of of this we we have a god who I, I love saying this all the time but i mean it every time we have a god who works in reversals god loves working in inverses in inverted ways i mean so on the face of it, this is, is very odd and almost even scandalous. I've heard it called scandalous before, and I'll explain why. So an omniscient and an omnipotent God chooses to take human form in the form of an infant. And the universal thing about all infants is that they have to rely on love and nurture from others to survive and live. You know, Kim, like the point you, you, you said a few seconds back, like, I'm now responsible for this living thing <laughs> here in my arms. So God choosing to be completely dependent on parents, choosing to impregnate 
we can just call it what it is. An unwed girl is scandalous even from a holy perspective. God loves humanity so much. God chooses Mary to be that vessel, this unmarried young teenager, even adolescent teenager sometimes is, is experts and scholars think that's even given her too much age. She was probably an adolescent. So we learn Joseph makes a bold choice as we have this scripture today from Matthew, that main anchor scripture. And that is that to dismiss her quietly. It's, it's, it's two bold choices he makes. That's the first one. The reason that is impressive is because he could have chosen to dismiss her loudly, which would have meant shame on her family and almost certain exile from the daily rhythms of the community. And, you know, as, as Americans, the separation of church and state is something that is normalized for us. First century Galilee, Jerusalem, that wasn't it at all. For, for the Jewish people, it was everything, all one way to live swirled together. So to be outcast from that community meant you were literally cut off from everything, the city, your life, job, family, a place to live, all that stuff. So in this series, to get our, our wheels turning on birth, the birth story and Advent and what this means for persons of color. So no doubt that over you know hundreds of years in this country, Black, Indigenous, Persons of Color, BIPOC, you'll hear me abbreviate it, people have read and digested the Advent and birth narrative far differently than white European descent people. And I, I want to show, I'm going to do another share screen, because I want you to look at an artist who did a, a modern painting of Mary and Joseph. Get ready for this thing. So check this out. The artist, uh, I don't know who it is. It's lost, it's lost to me because I couldn't find it. But this is a fascinating rendering of Mary and Joseph. We got a setting where they're out in the rain, no shelter. They're young. You can't tell, you might not be able to tell, but on, on Mary's shirt, it says Nazareth School. So I think, they're mean, I think the artist is meaning for us to understand she is young enough to be in school probably high school. Mm. We, have, we have a father with a phone book in his hand. What I infer when I look at this is he's calling around looking for places to stay anywhere. Over here in the top right corner, the artist really had a nice uh, play with words. So it's a motel, no vacancy, new main juror. The, it should have, the A has fallen off. So it would have said new manager, but it says new manger. So there's a little... <laughs> interesting little twist there but you know if, if we had to think about this in modern times the feeling this painting evokes is what i want us to to consider so we'll pull back off a of screen share for a minute i like that because it, it teases my mind into active thought that painting the birth story can be abstract sometimes because we've heard it so many times or because it was long ago. And I liked that painting because it reminds me how stark and vivid it must have felt for Mary and Joseph to have nowhere to go. I wanna spend a, a couple minutes talking about names in the Old and New Testaments. To know someone's name meant that you were in connection with them. And there, there was sort of a, a social uh, understanding, even a superstition that to know someone's name carried with it almost like a power you would have over someone. It's very unusual for us to think about as 21st century readers, but that was the normal context for them. Here, here's an example. In, in the scripture, whenever Jesus is, is doing his ministry, he's conducting his ministry, people who have demons, they call out to him, they name him extremely specifically. What do you have to do with us, Jesus, Son of God, the Most High? disciples, people, the crowds who were listening to him, no one was saying that, no one was calling him a name that specific. So the demon was correct in naming that, but it was not a name to show honor or respect. It was to try and claim power over Jesus, which is why Jesus rebukes the demons every time they do that, or he says, be silent. It's an unusual thing for us to wrap our heads around, but naming and having names 
as a symbol of power was something that was around in Old New Testament times. So Jesus' name, it comes from the Hebrew name Yeshua or Joshua, as we might say it, and it means God is salvation. So I have another little interactive part for us right now, group discussion. How are children or how were children named in y'all's families and communities? After, after um, ancestors. Sure. You know, I said, I said at the top of this meeting, Madeline's in Mississippi visiting a friend, <laughs> the friend she's visiting, they just had a little baby and the baby's name is Dorothy after the grandparent. Karen, Karen I saw you. Oh, um, I thought that my, my son and daughter-in-law did an interesting thing because um, uh, my son wanted to name their first child um, after him or after somebody on our side of the family. But my daughter-in-law said, well, no, he already will have your last name. So let's name him after my side of the family or just something that we choose because we like it. So they kind of did both things. They chose a first name that they just liked. And then they chose a middle name for both of their sons that was from the, the mother's side of the family. So I thought that was appropriate. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, Sarah, please. So in, in my family, my, my um, not my immediate family now, but the first male son was named after the father. So my brother was a junior. My dad's brother was a junior as well. They carried the father's name. And um, I think that's just something that was important to, to that family. We didn't do that. But <laughs> Mm -hmm. or can't but um you know that that just was one of the things that was kind of expected sure so the, the companion question to this one is how do the names how do names affect the social reception of someone here's what i mean by that how do the sounds of names generate a bias for or against someone mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, um, I, I know a way because it's been documented and people who have studied anthropology and sociology have documented this. And it's, and it's definitely something that is a dark stain on this country's history and still remains, it still remains as one. Names of BIPOC, let me, let me rephrase, names that sound BIPOC to certain hearers, you know, you're already making a you're already making a biased judgment about a name written down before you see someone, but name, names of names that sound I'm quoting that BIPOC people like that who have names that sound that way here's a here's a, a really acute example have tremendous trouble getting loans from banks. Mm -hmm. They 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 did studies on this and if you had a BIPOC sounding name mm -hmm. over contrasted against a white or European descent sounding name, you had a lot more difficulty getting a bank loan. And that's just one tiny example. Can you all think of any others? Yeah, Chris. That's along the same lines. I work in Durham. I uh, teach, I'm a library teacher. So I work in an elementary school and, you know, I have children who um, the spellings are different and maybe they sound similar to something you're used to but the spelling is different and you know I'm sure as they grow up it's going they're going to run into prejudice and um uh I've forgotten the word but like when you when you profile somebody based on the spelling sure. even sure um so I can see that you know yeah yeah Sarah yeah I saw your hand yeah. So I think that, I, as you were saying, people make assumptions about people. You'll read a name, you'll say, well, that's, that's a black person. You read a name, well, obviously they are Muslim. You read another name, well, they must be Hispanic. And I think based on society and, and some of the ways that we have profiled people or our biases towards people, we make assumptions about you know, whether or not they'd be good for a job, whether or not right. they'll do well in school, whether or not they can afford a loan or should be trusted with a loan. We, we make those assumptions about people. 
um, whether we we want to or should, obviously, right. or not. Yes. Yeah. It, it, there is an, We all carry around with us an implicit bias, and it's not like a switch that we can control throwing on or off. It it it's one of the. It's like the. It's like our nervous system. Parts of our nervous system run automatically. Blinking, pupil dilation, breathing. <laughs> Uh, we can't force those things to stop. There is an implicit bias that we that comes along with all of us. Um, so, at this point, what I want to do is I want to play for us the 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 song that we're going to use tonight, and it's called "Mary Had a Baby." I'm gonna I'm gonna screen share, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put the lyrics up too, so that you if you're having a hard time understanding, or if the if the internet glitches a little, you can read whatever what is being sung. So let me come back here one more time. Get some things ready. Here are our lyrics. And if you stand by with me here, so I invite you to get into a comfortable position and we're gonna to listen to our, our first one. So that's our our African American spiritual for tonight. Mary had a baby, and I'll uh, I want to parse that out a little bit. Every stanza ended with that refrain: "The people keep a coming, and the train done gone." Along with with African American spirituals, trains were a new reality in this emerging industrial age of the country in the early nineteenth century. So trains, you know, they connected people to places that had been previously isolated. And, and they had a lot of metaphor behind them, representing a way out, either physically, spiritually, or even with imagination. Train imagery, and I'm quoting Kirk Dugan, so you, this is not me saying this. Kirk Dugan is saying train imagery is prominent in African-American lore and storytelling. So she even references another song, Get On Board, Little Children, The Gospel Train's Coming. I hear the car wheels moving and rumbling through the land. And, you know, I, I can even think of a modern example, Curtis Mayfield, people get ready. 
the first line out of, out of the gate on that one, people get ready. There's a train of coming. Don't need no baggage. Just get on board. So, the, of course, the most resonant example of trains being linked to the African American spirit is, is the Underground Railroad. Mm. The who led the passengers, the escapees, you know, to stations, safe houses in the north on the way to physical freedom. So the concept of train is it's it's got a physical embodiment, but it's got a metaphorical embodiment too. It's bound for a more glorious state of being towards liberation, toward opportunity. So what did this spiritual when you know the, the original authors are lost to history? But when when slaves wrote this song, what do they mean by placing the image of Mary's newborn baby beside a train station? People think of coming, the train done gone. Kirk Dugan says this could have represented a spiritual warning. Mary's baby representing freedom, salvation, deliverance. Don't miss your opportunity to worship him. And she also says, with feet firmly grounded in their present situation, enslaved theologians, they would have proclaimed a way out of, of oppression, expressing the present reality, not to miss the opportunity to experience eternal freedom. I, uh, friends, I'm going to do, bear with me for one minute. I'm going to do a mute all because there's a little bit of um, background noise, but you, you can unmute yourselves when it's time. So we got the context of our, of our song, Mary Had a Baby. We have the, the context of the metaphorical and the, the physical concept of train and what that meant. So keeping that on one mental shelf in our minds, let's take, take a turn back toward our Matthew text. So Mary and Joseph engaged but not married. In, in antiquity, betrothal meant couples were as good as married for out of two out of three things, legally and socially, but not sexually. This was common practice to refrain from until full marriage. So Joseph has this dilemma. His fiance is pregnant and not by him. And this is extremely serious. And like Chris said a, a few minutes ago, by law, he could have had Mary stoned to death. That, that, go, that went back generations to Deuteronomy 22. That had been part of the DNA of the law of the Hebrew people for a long time. So this illegitimate pregnancy appearing as evidence of her being unfaithful to him and to the community. So we get one clue that Joseph was a righteous man. And the meaning is not that he was righteous to the law, that he made a spectacle out of planning to dismiss her, but it's actually the inverse. He was so righteous in a pure way that he was not bound or limited by the laws and the customs of the time. And he made a choice to dismiss her quietly, even though he's under social pressure to do the opposite. But thankfully, the even bigger action is that the angel visits Joseph, convinces him to remain with Mary. The name of the child is given. Remember what we've been talking about with names. Names represented power in antiquity. The angel gives the name to Joseph, Jesus, which comes from Yeshua, God coming to be with us. So this, the song we listened to, Mary Had a Baby, it's the song about, you know, birth of a Savior long ago, the coming of Emmanuel, God with us as well. So the, 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 the writers of that spiritual, the, the enslaved people demonstrated an understanding that even in slavery, God was present as they brought forth new generations, they themselves. Hope is the gift every child brings to the world. And I'm quoting Kirk Dugan here. She has a great line. She says this, every pregnant woman bears a potential liberator, one who may be anointed to increase freedom and justice in the world. I like that. It's pretty heavy, but I like it quite a lot. So there's some realities in the 21st century when it comes to, to pregnancy and delivery, and these, these are lenses that we carry with us. So we, if, you're, um, if you're in labor, you call 911, ambulance is going to come. You're in labor, you show up at the hospital, you legally cannot be turned away. Zooming out nationally and globally, this is not the reality that BIPOC people face. Childbirth remains a major cause of death for mothers and for children. And there's some data I want to share with you. The 
black infant mortality rate, 13.1 per 1,000, is more than double the rate of white American women, 5.6 per 1,000. It can certainly be noted that the study says that lifestyle choices um, can impact some of that reality, uh, smoking, um, obesity, genetics, but the mortality rate, here's the kicker, is the same for black women without any of those factors. Birth weight gives a window into this as well. And there was a study in 2007 in Chicago, and it revealed the birth weight of babies born to first generation African and Caribbean women. The birth weight dropped to 6.8 pounds compared with immigrant, their immigrants' mothers' babies, who were 7.3 pounds, and the babies of white women remained at 7.5 pounds. This stumped doctors, and it took them a long time to figure out what was happening, and they, f they finally were able to see analytically that the stress of racism endured by black women spending their entire lives in America was affecting mother and child in a physiological way. This is, uh, they call this symptomatic of something, a larger concept called weathering. And if, if you're not familiar with what weathering is, I'll define it for you here. And its definition is this, the stress inherent in living in a race conscious society that stigmatizes and disadvantages people of color, causing disproportionate physiological deterioration. So such that a black individual may show the morbidity or the mortality typical of a white individual who is significantly older. They say not only do blacks experience poor health at earlier ages than do whites, but this deterioration in health accumulates, producing ever greater racial inequality in health with age through middle adulthood. So what is the reaction from this? It manifests as higher levels of mortality, disability, sympathetic nerve activity, blood pressure, the, the, the scientific term for it's called allostatic load, but here, here's what it is in layman's terms. The cumulative wear and tear on the body's system owed to repeated lack of adaptation to stressors. So weathering is something that's really very real. And Sarah, you had a, a comment there. Also studies that say medical doctors do not take their symptoms as seriously. Yes, that, that also is part and parcel to it. So weathering is definitely a real thing. And some of y'all may have seen this without even knowing that's what you were looking at. It is very apparent in people who are facing homelessness. You can see it in their faces and in their bodies. When you have conversations with them and you learn how old they are, they look much older than they are. When you get the chance to speak with them and hear their stories, you have an understanding for that. When, when, when it's peak seasons, like for example, if it's extremely hot in the summer, extremely cold in the winter, they're out in these conditions. That has a cumulative effect on the body more than someone who has shelter. So children born during slavery, their families knew they were being born into hard times. Families were torn apart on the auction blocks as black people were sold like livestock. It was, it was an abomination. But nevertheless, in hope, Kirk Dugan says that there was a custom ancestors would sometimes ask when a baby was born. And that is, is this the one? Is this our Moses who will get us out of slavery? So one thought I have before I get to another set of questions for us is that so children are not responsible for how they come into this world. They don't ask to be born, right? But parents, caregivers, even the church, I will submit, must be the train that welcomes this gift of life and honors mother and child, you know, living with this hope for the salvation of the community with Jesus as, as one of the cornerstones, as the cornerstone for that. So the next set of questions I want to ask for the, the interactive portion we're, we're walking our, our tightrope here between the, the African-American spiritual, African-American context, pairing it alongside with our scripture. So turning, turning our gaze back to the scripture for a moment, what do the interactions of the angel that visits Joseph, God, but specifically Mary and Jesus, teach us about their faith? 
So I'll, you know what, and I'll tell you what, I can, uh, I'll type it in the chat. I, I forgot that I can do this. <laughs> what do, let's see, I'll stand by one second, friends. Here we go. What do the interactions of the angels, God, Mary, and Joseph teach us about their faith? One of the things that I infer uh, about Mary and Joseph's faith is that, you know, I don't know if uh, it, we, we, it's a mystery to us if they were scared. I think we can safely hunch they probably were. Even in that, they choose to stay together. They choose to ride it out and to have this baby out of wedlock, even though we know that's not the circumstances, you know, on the, on that downstream of history, we know it was the Holy spirit. People then did not know that. So that's something I think about. Kim had a good one. Mary for Mary obedience. Yeah, that's good. Uh, court. I'll read this on behalf of Courtney, considering the idea of God's faith, that Mary would be a willing vessel, even though she didn't sign up for this role. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's deep. That's the truth. Yeah, Millie, go ahead. Oh, and uh, sorry, uh, unmute yourself. Yeah, so I did a mute all a little while back. Friends, y'all can unmute yourself or I'll, I'll try to unmute you too, if it lets me. Millie, uh, should be, if you hover on the bottom left, you might see your mute uh, little microphone thing. I do. There we go. Even with my glasses, the screen is little. Uh, one of the things that I thought of is um, the, the, the righteousness of stoning mm -hmm. actually comes from their religious teaching and faith. And yet here is an angel saying, you know, this is God's will. It, it, I, I wonder if it felt like a betrayal of their faith that that, uh, that they were threatened in this terrible way at the same time that they should have been expecting joy and they were at risk. Yeah, that is a very, that, that's really thought provoking. I, I think I like that idea. Yeah, that the, the you know, the conventional faith they would have been surrounded by and brought up in the tenets of that are challenged yeah that would that would have been something it's Karen. the same type of thing as love your neighbor but <laughs> yeah yeah i would carry on read on behalf of her it had to be unshakable faith they actually believed this when it seemed unbelievable there there's always been for me uh it, and this will be uh i think it's next week but it's it, maybe it's two weeks out from now there's a really um it stands out to me as an enigmatic verse of scripture when the wise men come and, and they, they bring Jesus gifts and, and they, they come and worship him. The verse is, but Mary pondered all these things in her heart. And I, I wish, I wish we could take a time machine and, and go back and, and pull that out and extrapolate that. And like, you know, it's, there's so much weight in, the, in those words pondered in her heart. I really wonder too what she was thinking about, and you know I wonder if some of what we're describing here tonight these a reality that something new is happening that the old law is transforming. You know I, I wonder if she had thoughts like that. Yeah, Millie, Millie than Mary. Mm -hmm. um, if you go to see Michelangelo's um, sculpture of the Madonna and Child. The baby is about two, and and you can I, I mean you can just see on her face that she know she knows the whole story, she knows everything that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. and it's heartbreaking. I wow I um hey since you said it and since we got the internet right in our hands uh oh I'm trying to find it yeah here. I'll, uh, I'll, sh I'll share screen. We can, we can take a look at it together real quick. Uh, is this it right here? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's the, yeah, like her face, it, her eyes are down. Her, her head is down. There's definitely a gravity, a weight of what she understands. 
Yeah. And you know, Millie, that makes me think about um, something else too. The Mary's Magnificat is in, uh, it happens before uh, Jesus' birth. It happens when she goes to visit Elizabeth, who also had a, uh, was miraculously found to be pregnant and through the, through um, God's help along with, with uh, her husband. So that one was more conventional in those, in that regard, but she goes to visit her, her, her relative Elizabeth and Elizabeth, they, the babies leap for joy in the wombs. That's where we get that famous, that great Mm. verse, my baby, I could feel a leap in my womb. When that happens, Mary sings a song and in it, she talks about the concept that we, God is coming. Things are going to be turned on their head. Justice is going to look different. Love is going to look different. So I think she had, you know, in that moment, at least, whether, whether it was fleeting or not, doesn't matter. In that moment, she declared those things and had a, had a thought, had, a, had knew in her heart that that was going to be part of what Jesus brought. And, uh, you know, I love, I love hunching and wondering because the, we don't have a lot of information behind the curtain of the birth narrative. They on, they only, the birth narratives are only in Matthew and Luke. Mark, Mark skips them, John skips them. And in Matthew and Luke, they're really short about a chapter each, maybe even a little less. So there's not a lot behind it, but it's, there's so much gravity behind it that it's, it's hard not to wonder about what, what are those things are. So um, the second question I want to ask is part of Advent being an Advent mode, what I'll call it is a a combination of being expectant and anticipating. So first question, and I'll type this in, what does it mean to live in perpetual expectation? After long periods of time, how does one keep hope alive? So mm. I'll bring those in a minute here. So there it is. What does it mean to live in perpetual expectation after long periods of time? How does one keep hope alive? And, and I'll say something fascinating to, to me. So this, our study we're using, Mary had a baby, Kirk Dugan and Thornton, they wrote this in 08. And it's interesting reading it now. I, you know, I have a hunch that if they, if they had a chance to write it again, considering everything that has happened with race relations cumulatively since 2008 up till November of 2020, the polarization, the murders, um, I have a feeling that would impact this book a little differently, but, but, it's, but it's still a good resource. I bring that up to the date when it was written because COVID is on the brain, it's on all our brains, and it's interesting approaching Advent, a season of anticipation and expectation Think about that with this question. What does it mean to live in perpetual expectation? After long periods of time, how does one keep hope alive? So I'll, I'll just speak for myself. I live in perpetual expectation of a vaccine that is scientifically sound and ubiquitous enough to wipe this thing out. I, I'm living for that day. And as we keep drilling into the pandemic and as it gets longer, I, I find myself getting fatigued emotionally. So, so how does one keep hope alive? Uh, I think with hard work. Uh, uh, Chris, I see your hand. hand one second. Um, Edith, did you have something you wanted to add? No, I didn't want to add anything. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Uh, Chris, yeah. please. I think it's human nature to lose hope after so much time. Um, maybe not a year, but certainly when it goes on and on, and I may be getting my people mixed up, but was it Abraham who was told he was going to have a son, and then he kind of got frustrated, and then he ended up using the handmaiden, uh, okay, so he did, and he was like, okay, we're going to make it work another way, you know, Mm -hmm. and then you had, um, even when Moses went up on the mountain. He wasn't even gone that long. And now, okay, we're going to make this golden calf. And like, right. okay, they lost hope. And mm-hmm. you know, so it's in our human nature 
to lose hope if it lasts longer than we think it should. Yeah. It, so that perpetual hope just for some of us, we just, we lose it. And, and we have to go back to God and say, I'm sorry, God, I messed up and help me, help me in my own, I believe Lord, help me in my yeah, own belief. Amen. amen. Yeah. 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 Indeed. You know, um, yeah, we are, we, we are, we, we, we're a weird mix, aren't we? As human beings, Sim <laughs> we have simultaneously hope and have impatience as well. Sally, I saw your hand. Yeah. I mean, it's, I mean, I live this daily. Um, <laughs> it's kind of, um, you always have to bring yourself back and look at small things, little things, you know, that you can grab hold of and, and be grateful for and have hope for and step by step. <laughs> yeah. Because it's very easy to lose hope for the big picture. Mm. You know, if you're looking way out there. It, it, indeed it can be. That's, that's a, that's a, those are good points. I got two comments I'll read on behalf in the chat. Uh, first one from Karen. So the answering the question, living in perpetual expectation, how do you keep hope alive? This one, as a pastor, I love this. Uh, I, if I had a bell next to me, I'd ring it. Relationships <laughs> with people. Where we see God even when we live in sad circumstances. I can't imagine how slaves endured with hope for so many generations. And then Courtney says, speaking from candid personal experience, it's extremely hard to hold on to hope when the expectation feels past hope. There's something I've been looking to over a year and a half, and I find myself wavering a lot. It helps to find others in similar states and remember I'm not alone. Yeah, amen to that, Courtney. Yes, that's, I think that's one of, one of the strongest sources for wells of hope that we can look to is remembering we're not alone. And and being in relationships and community with people and relation that takes many forms it can it can be a spouse or a partner or family it, it doesn't have to be someone related to you My, church family uh a friend network um there there are there are ways that we can be together and that makes me think of a uh, an african proverb that uh is one it, it's it's one that I, I think is fantastic it's simple it goes like this it's two sentences if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So I think that's one of the ways we definitely keep hope alive. We go together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other? Oh, Millie, yes, please. I see your hand. Well, we also have a Bible. We, we have a Bible tradition to lean on also and, and a community of faith. But we're reading Deutero Isaiah in Keith's class. And the Hebrews have been in captivity. This is not the Mos This is not Moses. This is um, in Babylon for I think it's over three hundred years, yeah. and they've just about lost faith. But they haven't completely because the, that word is still there among them, and th and that's really important. Yeah, having having a history of people who've had to wait and wait and wait, and not lose faith, it helps us. I think. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think about too is that um, naming, honestly walking into and wrestling with, with grief, with emotions like grief and emotions like sadness, it's not something we naturally like to do, I would, I would say as humans, but, but it's something that is essential. And, I, and all that, I bring that up, uh, the Book of Lamentations is my favorite example on that. It's a really raw book, a, a book of sadness, but I think it's crucial that we have it in the Bible because it's, it's naming out loud anger with God, sadness with God, and I think that's part of being human is contending and expressing that and, and saying that it's okay, you know, having these emotions as, as humans and especially as people of faith is part of the, the faith walk. And so I think that's certainly, um, something that helps too. Uh, let's see. It's Jane. Oh, I, 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 sorry, you went black for a minute. Your screen went dark and now you're back. Okay, Jane. Yeah. I didn't know how to get my screen on. Gotcha. Now, 
with Christopher, who has not been home since March, and he usually comes home every other week, his just listening to him and his hope keeps my hope going. Because when we first started talking about the vaccine, that's all he talked about. So he just, but every time I talked, he still had that hope that the vaccine is going to going to come and he's going to get to come home. But I found that when this all started, I found this little saying that I thought was really cute. It's better to be at home alone than to be home and wish you were alone. And I, th I think of that a lot. I think of that a lot because I'm home alone and I, I'm I've, uh, not going, I'm teaching online. I'm not going in. But I found um, my faith, my God, and took over, took over, took over. He, he has really reassured me that the hope I have is really not of this world. And I think to get through the pandemic, I have to keep focusing on my, not my impatience and wanting it to be here sooner, but to be to be to look further beyond the the uh, races, race relations, the the election, everything that has gone we've gone through the, the family members who have lost them. And I think Um, because Christopher has so much hope that this vaccine's going to get him home. Mm -hmm. But I still have hope for that. Yeah. Well, and that's a beautiful thing. Like his hope is, and it, it's contagious. It's his hope is feeding hope in, in you. Like that's beautiful. That's good. Well, friends, we, I want to be mindful of our time and, and the covenant that we, that I've made with you all that this class would be an hour. And so we're, we're going to go to God in prayer and to what I want to do is um, I have another book of prayers by a writer named John O'Donohue. This one is called for a mother to be. And so this will be our closing prayer. And I, and as a thought experiment, what I'd like you to do is imagine if you could marry thinking, hearing these words and thinking about these words, if you were able to pray this prayer with her, just as a, interesting way to go to God in prayer. So let us, let us listen to these words that O'Donohue wrote. So let us pray. Nothing could have prepared your heart to open like this. From beyond the skies and the stars, this echo arrived inside you and started the pulse with life, each beat a tiny act of growth, traversing all our ancient shapes on its way home to itself. Once it began, you were no longer your own, a new, more courageous you, offering itself in a new way to a presence you can sense, but you have not yet seen or known. It has made you feel alone in a way you never knew before. Everyone else sees only from the outside what you feel and feed with every fiber of your being. Never have you traveled farther inward, where words and thoughts become half-light, unable to reach the fund of brightness, strengthening inside the night of your womb. Like some primeval moon, your soul brightens, the tides of essence that flow to your child. You know your life has changed forever, for in all the days and years to come, distance will never be able to cut you off from the one you now carry for nine months under your heart. May you be blessed with quiet confidence that destiny will guide you and mind you. May the emerging spirit of your child imbibe encouragement and joy from the continuous music of your heart so that it can grow with ease expectant of wonder and welcome when its form is fully filled and it makes its journey out to see you and settle at last relieved and glad in your arms amen brothers and sisters in christ peace to you all this evening everyone stay safe and We'll, we'll be back again next Tuesday for our next birth scripture and, and an, our, a new uh, spiritual to, to guide us. Peace be with y'all. Peace, Peace be with you, John. Thank you. Thank you.